I am delighted uh, to um, be able to welcome His Excellency with us, Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, my dear students, and I am pleased to see so many of them, even very young ones. Um, my name is Wolfgang Danzbegruber. I am the founding director of the Liechtenstein Institute on Self-Determination at Princeton University. And on this most interested interesting occasion, I am delighted to welcome you in the Dodds Auditorium at Robertson Hall at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. The institutions mentioned from the Liechtenstein Institute to the Woodrow Wilson School stand for the spirit of self-determination and democratic freedom. They stand for to define one's destiny to offer the individual man, woman, and child a voice and the opportunity to live in peace and justice and with human dignity. Princeton University, in addition to its mission for academic excellence and education for the next generation of, I dare say, the world's best and brightest, um, also stands for another dictum, Princeton in the nation's service and in the service of all nations. It is for this that I am personally delighted to be able to welcome President Mikhail Saakashvili, a man who has originally left his country, as so many of our students, to study abroad, indeed to come to the United States of America, and managed to study successfully and even to begin a promising legal career in New York City. Nevertheless, he then headed the call to go back to serve his nation as first a parliamentarian and then as a leader in critical times, even during hot conflict and war, and then again and hopefully in more peaceful and prosperous times. Just to make it clear, Georgia is a tiny country especially compared to its northern neighbor. It sits on the eastern shore of the Black Sea to the south of the Russian Federation and has only a population of 4.7 million inhabitants. Georgia today has two occupied territories, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. President Mikhail Saakashvili successfully tried to introduce policies and values to effectively root out corruption, especially also in the law and order services, and to foster democracy and actively encourage direct foreign investment and rapid economic development. A couple of years ago, while I served in Kabul, Afghanistan, in spring of 2008, there was a NATO summit in Bucharest, and very much encouraged by the then American administration, Georgia attempted to get closer to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. However, with little success. And a couple of months later, during August 2008, the crisis between Georgia and its northern neighbor, the Russian Federation, escalated by coincidence, especially during the Olympic Games, uh, into war, which resulted in those two occupied uh, territories of Georgia and also in countless um, um, displaced persons and many deaths uh, on um, all sides involved. Now, President Saakashvili is in the United States to come to the NATO summit in Chicago and will hopefully, and for the sake of Georgia, perhaps find another step to move closer to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Concerning the education of uh, President Saakashvili, I wanted to emphasize that, as I said before, he, after he graduated from Kiev University Institute of International Relations, he attended Columbia University in the city of New York as an Edmund Muskie Fellow and graduated there with a Master in Law in 1995. 
95 to 96, he then also studied at the George Washington University National Center of Law. And in 95, actually, he got admitted to the New York Bar and uh, practiced commercial law uh, at a New York law firm. In his political biography, which obviously then um, begins um, to intensify once um, Mr. Saakashvili returned to um, uh, Georgia, uh, it is important to notice that he was elected to the Georgian parliament in 1995, and already five years later, he was appointed Minister of Justice of Georgia, uh, where he instigated and then really intensified um, to confront post-Soviet Georgian uh, corruption. What is important is that uh, as a result of the 2003 parliamentary elections, which were considered to be falsified, uh, then Mikhail Saakashvili, and the late member of the Georgian parliament, Surab Chvania, um, united to reject uh, the election results and called on public protest, which eventually then launched the Rose Revolution, and this revolution culminated in Mr. Saakashvili peace peacefully leading a select group of courageous uh, visionaries to go to the parliament. As a result, January 4th, 2004, the people of Georgia elected the then only 37-year-old Mikhail Saakashvili with a percentage of 96% as their president. And um, President Saakashvili then became actually the youngest national president in Europe. Something for those of us young ones here uh, to aspire. Uh, and actually, I would like to emphasize a, a small uh, point here, namely that uh, uh, it was uh, a year later, namely in January 2005, that then U.S. Senator Hillary Clinton and uh, John McCain um, tried to nominate our guest of honor for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, President Saakashvili was uh, elected in a, uh, for a second term um, four years ago in January 2008 with 53.4%. And uh, this is in part uh, also because uh, his uh, efforts to root out corruption, his efforts to um, try to bring um, economic and social development um, to um, Georgia in spite of um, the boycott of Georgian uh, goods uh, by its northern neighbor, and hence to reach out to new global markets and bring in an innovative um, and um, a modern uh, economic foreign investment have slowly began uh, to take uh, uh, part uh, and to grasp uh, uh, within Georgian economic uh, development. Uh, I would like also to uh, emphasize uh, the, uh, his initiatives uh, concerning the port city of Batumi on the, on the um, um, uh, western part of the country. And uh, finally, would like to emphasize one a uh, major point for those of my friends in arms uh, who are serving in uh, uh, the United States and other military. Uh, because of his initiative, uh, Georgia has been a pivotal supporter of the um, uh, United States uh, Defense Forces, uh, especially the U.S. Marines in Helmand province in Afghanistan. I personally had the honor to meet some of the soldiers. Uh, and all told, since to December 2009, um, uh, Georgia has contributed more than 3,500 uh, soldiers uh, to that effort. With all this, in the nation's service, sir, welcome to Princeton. We are delighted, and please help me welcoming <laughs> President Takashi. Well, uh, Professor. Tampax Gruber, uh, you know, I'm very good at pronouncing names because, I, uh, because of my own uh, complicated name. But actually, Wolfgang, very much, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to be here. Uh, Princeton is a very mystical place for somebody who used to go or who, to live in New York. We know it's always somewhere out there uh, behind all the forests. Uh, very, very mystical place. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry for being late, but more we were driving, more I had feeling that it's really, it's just, you know, it does, doesn't exist because it's like, <laughs> so finally I'm here and you are real. And um, so, I, I, so I try to be, I'll try to be real with me. But actually I wasn't, I'm not, I'm a 
kind of uh, person that is not supposed to exist at all at this moment, uh, of a country that hardly had any chance to exist or survive. Uh, by myself, you know, I have to quote, uh, uh, there is a very smart man in Russia, their foreign minister Lavrov, who says, uh, there is post-Soviet space is one big spiritual uh, sphere uh, with only one anomaly, the Georgian government. Uh, so I represent anomaly, my existence is anomaly, my country is in many ways anomaly because in 2008, and it's, uh, it's uh, good that there is no map here because it would be too scary, hundreds something times more bigger country attacked my small country. And you know, they've been attacking different countries in their history. They've attacked uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968. Um, Czechoslovak government fled within, I mean, fell within, hour, within hours and had to sign a humiliated defeat. They attacked Hungary in 1956 and Hungarian uh, president was uh, hanged uh, by the occupiers. They, uh, they went into Afghanistan, killed the president within, in one hour. Uh, and Afghanistan is a much bigger country than Georgia in 1979. Um, and they've done other things, of some of which are very little known. They've done coup d'etats, regime change, etc., all around the world, from Africa to the, all go to other, to the Asia. So basically, this is, uh, we are anomaly because this hundred times bigger country invaded my small nation. I mean, that tiny is not, I mean, they always said the small, tiny country. Well, we are as big as average, normal uh, country, say, in Central and Eastern Europe. But of course, in comparison to whom attacked, we are small. Uh, they officially said, when the US government asked them in 2008, in the year 2008, what's their plans about Georgia? And this is, I know, official, and you can also read it in WikiLeaks if you are not in your US uh, public service because they are not uh, permitted to read this. Uh, but if you, but as an academic, you can read it. Uh, they officially said, what's the goal of your invasion into Georgia? The response of the Russians was full annihilation, complete annihilation of the country. Not of the government, but of the country. Uh, the same day, uh, now my fr friend uh, Nicolas Sarkozy will have lots of time to write memoirs, and he was. The, I think he will again go back to this subject. There was a long conversation between him and Vladimir Putin, and Vladimir Putin specifically described to him in very detailed anatomical way by which parts of my body he was going to hang me within the, few, the next few days. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the, a few days later, um, then President Medvedev was, uh, you know, appeared on television and said, uh, Saakashvili, who is Saakashvili? He's, uh, uh, he's a political cadaver. Um, and so, basically, uh, here I am, uh, four years later, in, fr in the middle of the so, auditorium, uh, with all my body parts intact, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, being, I, I'm supposed to be a cadaver. I'm still very much alive and kicking. Uh, and my country is supposed to be a total failure. And it's by all means, uh, when you talk about where my country is, I again want to quote uh, invaders of Georgia. A few days ago, uh, uh, former president, now prime minister Medvedev, who signed the occupation of Georgia regions, as Wolfgang has mentioned, said two ways. Of course, well, first he made a statement on Russian television saying we would like to imitate Georgian police reforms, but we cannot as a country. We are too big for that. And then second day he said, when, during his confirmation in Duma, well, we know that Georgia implemented very successful reforms. We know, we know they're successful. Uh, we should, of course, learn from them, implement, copy whatever uh, they've done successfully, even if I, of course, hate Saakashvili. And that's, that's the biggest paradox that for, I, I don't, unheard of in history, I think, and there are students of history here, when 100 times bigger country invaded another one, um, failed to depose the government, failed, failed to take over it in, in its entirety, and four years later proclaims that, by the way, you know, maybe we should learn from this government, which we promise to hang by parts of their body, how to rule our own country. And that's, 
that's the big survival story of a very amazing one, almost miraculous one of my mm, country. I think this is a story which is not, we don't owe to military might or to particularly, you know, like heroic leaders or anything like that. I think uh, it's, this happened because of radical transformation, because of reforms, because of real changes that we implemented in society that was uh, doomed to be backward, that was doomed to be old-fashioned. You know, I was, be, I was uh, there is a recent, um, uh, one of the biggest architectural magazines in the world, it has the cover story in Georgia on Georgian architecture. And I read articles there, and you know, they're saying that, you know, this is one of the more world's most interesting reconstruction, construction process. Uh, absolutely new brand for a new country emerging with absolutely amazing new architecture but you know all the efforts are saying but you know it's not really Georgian this architecture it really doesn't feel fit their narrow streets and old-fashioned style and their you know uh, their traditional psyche as if we were doomed to be always in the middle ages as if we were doomed to be always backward as if we were to be some kind of nice sweet country where people would arrive to see like in some Himalayan resort, nice local traditions, uh, nice uh, things and remnants of the, and the ruins from 19th, 9th, 8th and 10th century or even earlier. And say, oh, enjoy dancing and singing, which is a very old tradition. And say, oh, it's no, it's no work, it's a nice country to sing. But that's not what our aspiration is. We want to create a modern <coughs> society. We want to be successful. <coughs> we want to be, uh, to learn from the others and to be ourselves role model for the region and maybe the rest of the world. And that is going on in Georgia and it impacts our region in large. But uh, uh, I think I also here to share my optimism and that idealism ultimately will prevail. And that force of ideas cannot be deterred either by old backward traditions or so-called backward traditions. I think most of them are just invented. Uh, by idea of cultural relativism, that some people are just not capable of changes and successes. Uh, there is a cultural handicap for some people, or even by authoritarian rule and brutality, or even the, by the force of money and uh, corruption. Uh, uh, I think it's based on our own experience. Um, Georgia was one of the most corrupt places uh, in the world. Georgia was much more, much more one of the most criminalized places in the world. Georgia was... Uh, one of the most hopeless and desperate places in the world. I'm not, I'm basing it on real data from the pollings that had been done in Georgia, that have been done nine, or that was done nine, 10, 11 years ago. Uh, we had this thing that this country cannot be fixed. That was doomed and hopeless. So we did lots of reforms. A uh, new generation came to power. Uh, after the Rose Revolution. And the list of reforms we did is absolutely amazing. We fired the entire police force, the entire customs office, the entire tax service. Uh, during the first year, half of our existing bureaucracy and civil service. We diminished the number of agencies by half. We uh, scrapped 90% of licensing and permits requirements from the government. And as a result, and for a small country to present itself, benchmarks do matter. And you should see what the benchmarks of Georgia is. The, we have the world's fastest uh, registration of companies, the world's fastest registration of property transactions. These are all IFC, the International Financial Corporation of the World Bank. The world's fastest customs procedure. We have the, uh, according to uh, the recent studies by EBRD and uh, IFC, we have in terms of perceptions one of the lowest rates in Europe, that also means worldwide. Uh, we are at par with a couple of Scandinavian countries. We used to be one of the most criminalized societies in the post-Soviet world. And we, uh, according to the last three-year survey of the European Union, right now are the safest country in Europe, the lowest crime rate in Europe. We are basically a safe society. 60 or 70 percent less crime than in Germany and France, four, four and a half times roughly less than in Russia. Um, uh, and I think uh, more important that this, I mean, also civil service has changed tremendously. I mean, the 
there is this uh, uh, Canadian Center of Law, uh, Law Justice, and together with Transparency International, they've done studies worldwide, and they've ranked Georgian bureaucracy as second most efficient and transparent in the world after New Zealand. More impressive, important than these benchmarks, a mental revolution has happened. The way how people talk, relate to each other, how they relate to institutions, how they respect the institutions. You know, our police has 5% confidence rate on, based on Gallup polls. Now it has 90. Uh, it's, high, it's the highest in Europe right now. We had, the, um, uh, we had uh, uh, tremendous mistrust in other institutions. We are, and actually, right now, every institution is more popular than, in, than the institution holder. Say, I mean, I'm still quite a popular president, but institutional pre presidency is respected more than my personality. Um, the, the same relates to parliament. It's much more popular than any particular parliamentarians. Uh, the same goes to government. The same goes to army. You know, say, police has 90%. It's much bigger than, say, head of police or minister of interior. Um, and so that's, that's the institutional change that has happened. Um, Georgia is, a, as you rightly said, a small country, but it has hugely strategic location because it's a gateway from Central Asia, Caspian Energy, rich regions to regions to most of the areas in Europe. It's also have, it's a now big transit route from Central Asia, Northern China, Afghanistan also to most of the European destinations. And uh, it's also, uh, and then, you know, despite all the shortcomings and mistakes we might have made, still it has created a new alternative model of uh, governance in post-Soviet space. The, the problem was that, you know, in the 90s, there were, there was, there were only two choices in, among former Soviet countries. To be messy, chaotic, uh, crime-ridden, corruption-crippled, and with freedom of speech, like Russia of uh, Boris Yeltsin, or to be more regulated, more, uh, you know, orderly, and of course, much more authoritarian, basically authoritarian, and like the one, the regime created by Vladimir Putin. And there was no other third way for us. That was the popular uh, assumption. And I think Georgia showed the third way. Of course, our democracy is not perfect, but we have certainly freedom of speech, of course, and uh, freedom of elections, and freedom of civil society. And of course, there are many things to be still fixed, but so we have very low crime rate, as I said. We have basically next to non-corruption. Seven years ago, eight years ago, in Gallup poll, 98% of Georgians said they've encountered corruption first head. Now, consistently, 0.1, or they heard something about corruption, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.01 on some polls. Amazingly low. Basically, it disappeared. And uh, so, so from that point of view, you know, we have now kind of really big, big tourists from, to learn our, our reforms from different countries. Every other week we receive delegations in from Kyrgyzstan, from Moldova, from Ukraine, from other neighbors, a lot of people coming from Russia to learn from our, our reforms. And that's something that really is very exciting. Because if, if ever those societies around us can also modernize, open up, become more normal, especially it relates to the Russian society, then all of us will be much better off. And uh, from that point of view, it is an interesting gamble. And that's why, you know, Georgian survival and success shows that ideas can sometimes be stronger than tanks and even money. It is a message of hope for all freedom lovers of the world. You know, we are still not there. We still have elections now, one or two, three years of elections. And again, we want to make, to make them as transparent and as open as we can make them, despite against all the odds, because people are really focusing them. Uh, but I think still the fact not the fact that I'm not abusing the fact that I'm here. I mean, it's not about personalities, but the fact that Georgia is still around and that it's being successful economically, visually transformed, mentally transformed, and it has become a shining example of uh, success 
at least for our region, which is not really seen from Washington or Brussels very well, but it's certainly very well seen in our region, also by the people who want to undermine it. This is a sign of hope for, of course, primarily for us, but all, for all of you who want to be policymakers in the future. My advice would be don't take anything at face value. Defy things all the time. Defy yourself, defy your own self all the time. That's also important to reevaluate yourself critically all the time. And uh, don't go for established dogmas because usually they, are, they don't mean anything. And just go for it. Be there and everything will be fine. That's all I wanted to tell you, and whatever you have to ask me, I'm here to respond to your questions. Just real questions. Don't worry, this is the Georgian choir which is leaving. <laughs> because we have our kids. Uh, Mr. President, thank you so much for. I not join them because I'm no. very, very miserable. Yes, exactly. They will gladly uh, sing for you. They will gladly sing for you. For this wonderful talk about changing things. Yes. Um, I'm enormously impressed with all the very big changes for the better in Georgia. Um, but I'm also curious, uh, how did you do it? Can you give us one or two examples? Yeah. Concrete examples. For example, how did you deal with corruption? How did you get rid of it? Thank you. Well, it, it's all about mindset primarily, because there are no schemes, there are no established blueprints how to do it. I think uh, primarily the, the, you need determined class of political elite that is absolutely determined to unroot corruption. That's, I think this is a very subjective thing. But then it's also institutional. We need, to, as I said, we fired the entire police force, it's generational, because we changed, we brought in totally new younger people, and this, in our case it was absolutely instrumental to, to the success because uh, you, we got rid in public service of people with bad experience, and that, that experience was almost 100% handicap. I still don't see anything positive being in Soviet or post-Soviet corrupt regimes. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, we diminish bureaucracy when I talk about institutions that you, know, you, you also need to diminish discretion of your civil service. For instance, like to give an example, we, police was relatively easy to fix. We fired the old ones, we brought new ones, we trained them, we gave them nice uniforms, nice cars, nice glass transparent buildings. Buildings do matter. You know, first we shape our buildings as church was set and then our buildings shape us. Every new building of administration, Georgia, or basically 80% of them are new, 100% in police, 100% in courthouses, 100% in prosecutors, 100% uh, in public service halls. Uh, when you do them, you know, when you do glass transparent buildings, they change the psychology of not only people who are inside them, but also people who drive across them, who, are, who interact with them. Um, but so we fired the police force, we brought new ones, it was relatively easy. But with customs, it just didn't work. I mean, we fired several times all the customs officers, and new ones would be just as bad. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, you know, brilliant idea came to the mind of some of our people. Maybe we should get all together rid of the customs. Uh, well, first of all, we have zero tariffs on most of the things, but what we did, we put everything on, you know, electronic kind of surveillance. Uh, all the uh, cargo is tracked electronically. And uh, I brought one of the heads of states. Uh, basically, I mentioned to him that, uh, uh, that uh, average truck takes around seven minutes to go through customs. If it's more than one hour, customs, well, whoever official is there, they get fired because there's, it's hard to explain why. I mean, it's, nobody can explain. They, there is a special investigation. They will have trouble. And then he laughed at me and he said, where do you get such customs officers that would work for such miserable, in such miserable conditions, even if they have high pay? And I said, let's go there. And we went there and I said, look at them. And these were young uh, uh, 
girls and uh, you know guys from maybe in their early 20s. And I told them, these people are not customs officers. These are here to smile. They come here, I mean, some girls came from model agencies. Uh, they are recruited here to say a few phrases to, you know, you get this, uh, uh, without, you know, sexes here because as they are gender, they, it's not open for only for, it's like gender neutral, but you, somebody comes in and uh, unshaved truck driver and is met by these smiling young people who address them several phrases in several foreign languages, and that's all they do. The rest is done by computers, by cameras, and the rest is not their business. It's not their discretion. They cannot decide what to stop or what, to, what cargo should go through. That's why they have, because they have no discretion, it goes fast. And, the, and we don't really lose anything by that. You know, basically most of the cargo is uniform and you don't really get shipment of something very unusual, usually when you have already well-established trade routes. And uh, that's, that's, that's one of the examples how we do. Or we have now public service halls. And public service halls means in every big city, and there, by the way, each of them is an amazing piece of architecture without you know, exception. We really recruited best of our own national architects and foreigners to do them. And the idea there is that somebody that goes, everything is done in one building. You get, uh, you get uh, to get your ID, passport, or pay fines, or uh, or to do property transactions. For instance, I mean, I'm a lawyer. I mean, most of the, my work as a commercial lawyer was to do, to do due diligence on property transactions, right? Lawyers have lost, has lost, have lost this job in Georgia because in Georgia, lawyers no longer do it. It's done by computers in this property hall. They are doing the whole thing in five, seven, 10, 15 minutes. The whole due diligence on, you know, what's the background of that property. It's all computerized. So what we have, we have the software, but then, uh, and we also have tricks like, for instance, there is a new House of Justice, which just, by the way, two days ago, they've got a prize for the UN uh, for the best uh, public service reform uh, for last year, but I think it's the really invention of a decade, decade frankly, uh, worldwide. We have now uh, this thing uh, called uh, drive-through, and it's called Just Drive, like just like Mac Drive. Uh, hopefully, McDonald's will not sue us. And we also have uh, Just Cafe. And you go in and you drive in, you, you give your documents into the window, and they're supposed to process that fast so that the, other, the car behind you does not get, uh, you know, um, they don't get uh, delayed. Or you go into a cafe and you order coffee and passport. And your passport should arrive with the speed of coffee and price should be included. I myself, I mean, I needed to, we did just, uh, I needed my electronic ID for something. Uh, for some public event, and I went to, in the morning. I was driving in the city in the west, the city of Batumi, about which Donald Trump just said on the, on the record on Fox News four days ago that five years it will be the best city in the world, and it will wipe off uh, Las Vegas from the map in a few years' time. And I, I fully agree with them. I encourage you to come and see. And uh, uh, you know he's sometimes hyperbolical, Donald, but I think in that respect he even, uh, um, I mean, underestimated but to me. Uh, but but, but uh, actually, I went to this, I was driving to Batumi Airport, I went to this public hall, they didn't expect to see me. I had to stand in line with three people. I, I got my number, through which I was taking my ID. Then I had to go into this machine to get, throwing coins and get my photo. Uh, and if you want, like you do free, and I didn't like those free, and you have to have additional coins to get another one, coins. Then I went to the girl, and she said, she told me, well, if you want to get it, and I was all the time looking at my watch, I have this habit, but anyway, but I, I'm always in a hurry. So the, then the, she told me, if you are in a hurry, it's like it would cost you like half price to get it here. Where are you going? I said, in the evening, I have a public event in another part, in the eastern part of Georgia, which is like one and a half hours helicopter ride from there. He said, we will, you can go there and pick up your ID, because if you don't have 15 minutes now in the evening, no problem, but it will cost you twice as much. Fine. Got deal. I arrived there on my helicopter. I drove on my way, got the ID. And the way I, I'm explaining to you, first of all, the way how it works. Second, president is equal among equals. You know, we create this system, but you know, they, you cannot even pretend not to stand in line. Uh, or, or you claim that you have special privilege even if you're in a hurry. 
And that's ultimately something unheard of in our part of the world, but something that works pretty well. And, you know, we've been very often criticized by different international institutions, by in Europe, you know, worldwide, that, you know, they are too fast, they're, we don't really understand what they're doing. Uh, they, sometimes they were seeing behind this some kind of authoritarian things that we want to do things fast, but in the end, well, they're coming themselves to learn from Georgian experience. We are still not, GDP per, PPP per capita will go to 6,000, I think, next, next year, we're still low middle income country, but we started from 800. Uh, or 900, we were basically a very poor country. Uh, and so we're not there, we don't have oil and gas, and so sometimes I think most of the time I think we're lucky we don't have it. Uh, and uh, otherwise, that's how we do things. Sorry for a long answer. I would also like to invite my students to come forward to the microphones, please. Please, sir, go ahead. Good day, Mr. President. Yeah, hello. Uh, I have a question about the judicial system in Georgia and the court in Georgia. And also I have two more questions, if you let me, to, I will be very short. The first of all about the judicial system in Georgia. The official statistics says that 99 percent, 0.7 percent, defendants are recognized guilty by the Georgian courts. Why happens so that why everybody who is arrested is guilty? More of this, the more, the more than the half of the male population in Georgia, they are sentenced and they are freed after paying money in the budget. The second, the Russia, you, you are telling the Russia, and I agree with you that we fought with Russia and it was terrible, but why happened so that after this war, when they occupied our 20% of territories, why did you vote for the Russia's entrance in World Trade Organization? And the second, why do you sell them all the businesses in Georgia? They control the mobile networking, they control the transportation, they control banks, the Russians, who are our enemies, as you say. Why happened so? And the third is the question, just, just, just work with Three days ago, just three days ago, there was a disaster in the capital of Georgia, in Tbilisi. There was a very heavy rain and flood, and there were five victims, you know that, and two of them, there were children. The very next day, where was the disaster in Tbilisi, in the country? Is it true that you were on the football match in Slovenia and the next day you were shopping in Milan and buying very expensive watches? Is it true? Thank you. Are you together, right? No. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, so, well, first of all, I, I would not comment on the, uh, the Last one, but uh, uh, with regard to the information on uh, judicial system, I think our judicial system uh, is a very interesting way of also part of transformation because judiciary in Georgia had 10% confidence when we took over. I think it has now something like 70, and it's very important. I think a caseload grows dramatically, which is a very, very important uh, case of, uh, you know, how people trust judiciary. We just introduced, by the way, ju jury trial. Um, it was a hard thing to do. Most of the European countries don't have it. Most of them do criticize us for having it. And uh, first cases were bumpy. But you know, it's bumpy, but I have trust in popular decisions. With regards to plea bargaining, we have plea bargaining process. Of course, people cannot get away by paying money. We had initial cases when people did pay money and get got out, uh, corrupt officials of previous government. This was the right way to do, uh, because that's exactly how people who are now trying to get to power and who are, by the way, pay, paying people also to ask questions, uh, they, that's how we believed that we would get rid of, but we, don't, we didn't mean, need mafia leaders in prison, with money, outside prison, trying to manipulate it through media and through other things. We would rather get in our impoverished budget money back from them. That was our initial practice. I think since then, uh, there was corruption cases also in my government, and people didn't get away by paying money. They had to serve their sentences. There were several members of parliament who were in prison, there, who were in prison. There were deputy ministers who were in prison. There was a minister who was arrested and sent to prison. So actually, we've been having tough practice on corruption, and it was no longer possible to uh, get away with, by paying money. Now, with regards to... Uh, plea bargaining system. You know, it's the same system in America, it's the same system in many European countries. Most of the cases are settled in pre-trial detention case. Once the case gets to the court, 
which usually goes with plea bargaining, and that's how it works, system works. There's a trust between judiciary, but also the people, but also the prosecutor's office, they get an integral part of that system, and the fact that it works so smoothly, that gives produces statistics. Of course, uh, because most of the cases are stopped also at the preliminary cases, and many people get out without getting sentenced, without going to the court. That's how the system works in Georgia, and that's how it works in most of the democratic countries. And that's how the whole thing works, functions. That's more or less what I want to say. But basically, the fact is that right now, some of our initial practices that were criticized even by some people in the European Union, they were, uh, uh, they were uh, now coming to Georgia and making seminars how to combat crime or how to combat corruption, Georgian style. Indeed, the World Bank just did a book on Georgia's uh, case of solving corruption. And you know, they told us when I went to the World Bank, the Vice President of the World Bank, he said, you know, we had already several dozens of books on corruption problem in different countries of the world. They've done lots of studies. He said this is the first time in history that the World Bank comes up with a book on solving corruption issue in a country. And that's basically, you know, and they've been going around, and what I was impressed with, that they were invited by you know, governments in Africa, in Asia, like Mongolian government, like Kyrgyz government, but some governments in Western Europe invited the authors of the book for presentation closed with the governments of those countries how to solve corruption issue in Georgian society. And that's absolutely, not in Georgia, Georgia how, in their own societies, that's absolutely remarkable. You know, when I hear that, say, Swiss government that did the case study of Georgia, in their, you know, whatever board they set up, or when you hear the same thing about Belgium, when you hear the same thing about some other Western European countries, that really shows you how far we went in that experience. And uh, as I said, you know, we are also not perfect. We are learning from the other still. You know, we are still learning, say, from Baltic countries like Estonia. We are learning certain things, not, you know, banning chewing gums, but certain things like how to do liberal hub economy from Singapore. We are learning from so South Korea how to do transformation from rigid post-authoritarian system to really open-minded economy and again being a hub and high technology place. So, you know, we also have to learn, but it's nice news that some people are also learning from us. Thank yeah, you thank very you. much. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I have a question about the Anaklia Tourist District. Sure. sure. Um, this new tourist district will bring a lot of um, uh, a lot of economic development to yeah. Georgia through foreign tourists, um, especially uh, to my understanding through Turkish tourists who will come for the gambling. Uh, my question is, um, what is the logic of locating this tourist district right on the border with the disputed territory of Abkhazia? Um, is this putting Georgians and foreigners in harm's way, or is it part of a larger defense strategy? Well, you know, uh, uh, Georgia is a small country, as it was said many times in this hall. So. Uh, nowhere in Georgia would you would be out of harm's way if we are saying that, you know, like Russian troops at 40 kilometers from our capital. So, you know, every day, I have to admit it, you know, their missiles are pointed in my office. They're not very precise ballistic missiles. I would have been, country would have been safer if they had been precise, but we know that they are not. Uh, so, uh, so actually, everybody who lives within dozens of kilometers from my office is at risk. So you wouldn't really say it exactly of the, if they are in Anaglia, they will in harm's way, you know, because Batumi, which is the most booming city in post-Soviet world, Batumi actually is, uh, uh, is also within reach of Russian troops, within, and still it had the most booming real estate market, I would claim, in the whole post-Soviet world. And this is the paradox of the country, the country that has, is technically, not because we want it, but because they want it, at war for, with Russian neighbor, they, this country has, uh, because they don't recognize our borders, they, don't re they officially want our government out, they officially don't recognize even ceasefire agreement they themselves signed. And still, and there was this uh, gentleman who was asking them and who just left, uh, you know, we have, the, we, we have open door policy towards Russians. You know, there are many uh, investments in Batumi, in Tbilisi, they are from Russia, indeed. I mean, not, mo not like half of them or like, but I would say 10% maybe more or less in some of different forms, money from Russia coming and taking part in Georgian economy. 
We've done, despite the fact that you know, there is visa-free, uh, basically impossible to get to Russia from, from, uh, from uh, my country, from my citizens, we have visa-free travel from Russians. This year we expect up to one million Russian tourists to travel to Georgia. The, uh, there is a, uh, on WTO, so for instance, we voted for Russian accession because Russia gave in, basically they never remembered those regions when they were negotiated. They said, okay, we'll put international monitors or Georgia's international recognized borders. That was quite an achievement of our diplomacy. But we still believe that having the Russia in WTO is better for us because at least eventually some rules would be applied. If you are a small country, for you, you know, there is the old, you know, why we need, for instance, Russian tourism? Because if you get one million Russians that would go back, and in a country where official propaganda is selling to them absolutely horrible images of Georgia, right? You have one million people who come in to a country that has no corruption, that has rapidly growing infrastructure, everything that they are longing for, but they cannot get. Then you get one million stories in Russia, inside Russia of, you know, of uh, uh, first-hand people who, say, who will tell them that Georgian government or Georgians indeed don't eat children. And that's very powerful. And that's why it's also a security factor for us. If you get more Russian businesses to invest money in Georgia, that's fine. I mean, that's, I mean if it's a genuine investment, that only will get some kind of small or whatever, maybe not so much influential, but people with some little influence inside Russia that have stake in Georgia stability, that have stake in, say, if they're building a hotel in Batumi, they have stake in Batumi not to be blown up by Russian missiles. So these kind of things. And that's why, you know, what else is a choice for a small country? Be entrenched and shout, oh, you know, we are being harassed, we are being attacked, we, are being, we might be wiped out from the map. Or the, cho the choice is to go for it, to you know, really you know, try to engage even country with a very hostile government and hope for better times when you know, rain will pass, you know, the, 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 all the things will pass and we'll be in better situation to talk people to people. And I think there is no alternative, it's a rhetorical question. And that's what we opted for, more rational option here. Great. Yes. Thank you, uh, President Saakashvili, again, for coming to Princeton. It's a real honor for us to host uh, the head of what is a very young state, but also the representative of one of the world's oldest uh, cultures and civilizations. As uh, Professor Donspec Ruber uh, noted in his opening remarks, the territories of Abkhazia and Ossetia are currently not under Georgian control. And that's arguably the result of a process that began a little more than two decades ago. And so my question to you is, are, are there anything, uh, what's your assessment of Georgia's role in the alienation of those territories from Georgia? And um, are there any things that you regret as far as uh, Georgian's policies you know, over the course of the past uh, two decades? And if you could go back in time, you wish things could have been different. Well, uh, it, you know, it's, if any are politics, you should keep asking yourself this question all the time. We do, do things differently. <laughs> but, uh, but um, I, I prefer not to focus on the past. We would rather focus on the future. Uh, these places, they have they've been cleansed uh, of their population. I mean, South Ossetia has six or 7,000 people left. It used to have up to 100,000 before, like conflicts in the 90s. Um, we had uh, in Abkhazia something like 80 to 100,000 left out of 600,000 that used to live there. Um, so, so these places are empty. It's not really, I mean, there was, it's a result of not even ethnic cleansing, of multi-ethnic cleansing, which is to say they threw out everybody who didn't want to leave uh, or to agree with the people who are throwing, to out, uh, who are throwing them out, expelling them. So I think the way to approach it, that's why I'm more focused on the future, is that to develop Georgia, the re remaining parts of Georgia under our control, that remain under our control like crazy, make it really successful, build all our new cities, skyscrapers, you mentioned on Anaglia, but next to it we are trying to develop now new port zone of Lazica. And you know, it's, we're talking about dozens of miles of Black Sea coast, the best trading routes, shortest way from there to China and from to Europe, totally undeveloped. It's not about being next to Abkhazia, it's just one should look at the map and see that we need to develop them. It's so simple. So we just introduced constitutional amendment 
um, uh, to make special status for, for this city, special jurisdiction, which is to say they'll have special governance, they might be apply uh, uh, special legal regime, say British law to commercial transactions or some other law. But of course it will be, uh, I mean, under Georgian government, but with special status. And this will be, by the way, first case in my recent I'm memory of recent history when really democracy, a democracy develops new cities. That's why you also want public debates, but we need to develop this. We need to get it. It's not like I decide, looked at the map, and there's a kind of authoritarian rule, here I need a new city and it should rise. No. Uh, it should only raise. Well, we don't have oil income to just put the things on the map. We need people who would be interested in doing that. And they need democracy, they need predictability, they need rule of law, they need transparency, they need efficient government. And that's what we provide as a framework. But otherwise, it's their business. So when I see, but it's next to Abkhazia. So what we do is that, you know, we, we develop the cities, we build the other things. The other day, you know, the other day, I, wa I, I was going around with dozens of NGO activists from these occupied regions. They came, I mean, totally like uh, anonymous, without press coverage. And, you know, and they want, I knew that they were there somewhere. So I said, maybe I should meet them. They said, oh, of course, we would meet, but please, no cameras. I said, no cameras, fine. And uh, I took them around to show proudly what we are building. It took, us, took me some time. Uh, but you know, when you, when I, these were mostly young people. It was an amazing experience. Like, if we had had this to offer to them, like 15, 20 years ago when this conflict started to really emerge, I would, we would have no conflict and no foreign manipulation would have ever enticed them. We, we were not mature for that. Of course we are mature now, but the thing has already happened, so how do you get it or get over it? I think with new generation, I think we have no new generation ruling Georgia, we'll have new generation coming to that place, to, I mean one place has no population left, but to at least to another one, and then gradually, and then the other thing, Russia should modernize. Russia should become a normal country. Once it starts to get rid of imperial nostalgia, that's the best way to get into Georgian, uh, Georgian uh, you know, to, to, for Georgia to get, become again full and integrate. But for us, as I said, it's, it's now focusing on this better future and uh, you know, much more open society. Lady. Um, thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Um, um, I am a student here in the economics department, sure. uh, and I've actually had the chance to witness all the changes you were talking about in Georgia in the past few yeah. years. Um, so um, that's been really an exciting opportunity just to see all the um, infrastructural changes too, just physically all different buildings and everything. So my question relates to the renewable energy sector, because I think that's, uh, even though Georgia's not very well endowed with natural resources, that's a sector that um, can be further developed, especially in hydropower. I know some of the projects have been going on, but I was wondering what your um, focus on the renewable energy sector would be and what kind of approaches yes. you have in developing that. Well, as I mentioned, we don't have oil and gas, but we have huge hydropower resources, and it's amazing because eight years ago we were importing 90% of our electricity from Russia, and now we are exporting electricity to Russia. The only commodity that we export to them because of embargo, as you described. So, actually, this is uh, mm, we are doubling our hydropower capacity within the next uh, four years. We are, will be uh, big exporters, but it will still be less than 20% potential. And still, if we don't manage to build them in time, We'll have deficit because Georgia is developing so fast. So from that point of view, as minimum, we should make it self-sufficient. It's a good tool to you know, make a hub from north-south because we are doing it to Russia, uh, to Turkey, uh, east-west because we are doing it to the European Union for Turkey and to Armenia, Azerbaijan in the east. Um, and uh, we have lines in all directions. And it's really a big, big uh, project. And you know, it's also big, uh, Grow, drive from, uh, drive, driving force for growth because I think starting from next year we'll go back to double digit growth. Last year we had 7%, this year we hope to get 8 or 9 unless the world goes to hell and there are some signs of it as well, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, if, it doesn't, if, if ever it doesn't happen, then we'll go back to our double, double digit growth next year. And from that point of view, I think we'll be uh, you know, this will be also uh, clean energy is something very nice. You know, for instance, we are really still, we, we, I want to turn Georgia into electric car producers. We have plans, we are working with several investors about that. 
My pers me personally, I'm driving electrical all the time, and we also in in induce all the other government to members to move to electric cars. First of all, it's nice to drive, but then the conscious of the fact that you don't pollute, and at the same time, economically, it's much better. It just, I mean, it, it's, uh, in, in terms of our prices, it's twice more profitable to drive electric car than, than the gas, gas car, gas powered. And, and it's really, and, it, and once you sit in it, you understand that you don't want to sit in anything else, actually. So I encourage all of you to also consider this. You know, by the time you become presidents, prime ministers, senators, etc., you'll all be driving electric cars anyway, but uh, that's my deep conviction. Maybe you'll be powered by party by Georgian electricity. Then. Terrific. Well, this is you speaking here in a green university. So I take uh, the prerogative of the chair. We have only three uh, questions now left. I will combine these three because the Georgian government has been nice enough to supply some Georgian wine and other goodies for a reception. And Dr. Wilson School, whom I wanted to thank <laughs> in the name of LIS and the guests, will offer this together with us. So uh, can I take the liberty? I combine your three questions together. Sir, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I would like to thank you, St. Uh, Georgian soldiers, for support uh, they sacrificed in Afghanistan. Right. My son served in, Arga in Afghanistan and met Georgian soldiers, and Where I would like to thank you personally, your government, and Georgian people for this. I would like to ask uh, one question about Russia and Georgia also. Um, traditionally, Russia is a home for many ethnic Georgians for centuries, and now they play an important role in Russian society, among business uh, world, art, in many, many, um, many, many spheres. Russian intelligence, intelligentsia, a lot of people in Russian intelligence are ethnic Georgians. What do you think? When and how? Georgian government will be able to restore full relationship between Russia and Georgia. What we need to accomplish for this goal. Thank you very well, much. Well, uh, I think uh, it's very simple. I mean, uh, simple and difficult. Because Russia should change. Uh, and uh, 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 no, and because I mean, look, it's also the point that Russia has been losing lots of soft power in post-Soviet territories. And uh, it's not only that somebody wanted it. I mean, I want people to be the speakers. We invited 10,000 Americans to teach English in Georgia. We have 2,000 right now in Georgia. We are expecting 500 more in the, in the fall. And you know, uh, we have almost that number of high schools. So every high school, a kid when they get to school, they get a laptop from the government at the age of five. And first lesson they get is from an American in English. Uh, we also did subtitles. I will, we want to be English speakers because if you just, we, like, we have now this computerization program and we'll get internet to 80% of all the village rural areas. And so, and there'll be computer, like kind of you know, local internet cafes, but centrally administered in every village. But if you don't supplement it with English and with way to get information, they'll just, you know, gossip with each other and go to maybe some other you know, dubious site. So, uh, so, so from that point of view, English is absolutely essential. I've been telling Russian leadership until the moment when we're still on speaking terms that you are losing us. Not when we mean us, not only us, but all this post-Soviet space because you go to Ukraine and now people, uh, even Ukrainians who speak to, like regular Georgians, they start to speak English because Russia has lost this appeal of being soft power, as it was even in Yeltsin's time. Russia was poor in Yeltsin's time, but you, they were, you had appeal, like the Russia had appeal for democracy, for something, for open society. People watch Russian television, it's over. Uh, and so from that point of view, only money doesn't count. You know, we, we have right now Russian money, huge amounts of it in Georgian politics. Some of it, is, you can see it traces here. Uh, but, uh, I mean, so what? In democracy, it doesn't mean anything. It just provides for extra headache for some law enforcement that has to, I mean, not law enforcement, but like special uh, election bodies and the others who, who control how elections, electioneering is fueled by different sums of money. It just takes few questions in audience like this. People, they send to, okay, respond, no problem. That's not the issue. That's not gonna change the equation. The, the, what it really means is that we need to see much more modern Russia, modernizing ones, to again be interested. 
just you know going to the history that of course we had Pushkin and Lermontov and Desenin and they were all there. I can quote them. I, I think I can quote them much better than any of Russia's today's leaders. That's however, right. however, the problem is that next president or leader or prime minister or whoever of Georgia will might not even speak that language. I'm not talking about quoting the poets. I'm still a relic to already. Uh, so from that point of view, to get a new appeal, you know, what we are getting now in Georgia, I'm seeing those new tourists sometimes in the streets. And this is a post-Soviet generation. There are people in their 20s, Russians, Ukrainians, others. When they come, they say, they've not heard anything about Georgia. But they like the place as it is now. We already have found this bond now. But as I said, you know, they're, they're among the others. You know, Russians are among Ukrainians, Kyrgyz, Japanese, South Koreans, Chinese more and more, Turks, Germans, they're among the others. And they're, they don't have any more this special clout and appeal because they're just, you know, and they, by the way, they're not also very much different from the others because it also has become much more globalized and very unified society from that point of view. It's a, it's a good hope, by the way. So for what I'm explaining is that let's, well, if Russia really starts to modernize, open up, give good examples, then everybody would fall in love with that country, with that new Russia. But for that, uh, the country needs, from my point of view, as minimum democracy, respect for society, rights for everybody, and then it will come up. And of course, the, uh, to get rid of corruption. That's, that's very clear from my perspective. Not because I'm a big expert of Russia, I'm not. Don't get, but I was expert on Georgia, we were the same. <laughs> and uh, I can tell you that it's all the same. But the problem is, Finally, that how the way how the old generation of Russians perceived Georgia, it was of course big cultural ties, but also it was a little bit of oh, the Georgians are good. They have good singing, they have good uh, wines, they have good, they can dance well, but they can never organize a modern state. And now, for the first time in the Caucasus, something very unexpected happened. We organized functioning, transparent, efficient state, and that's really you know, nightmare for some policymakers. But, you shouldn't have, but if Russia is modern, they will only like it. They will not uh, object to it, they will embrace it and try to develop relations. That's how we see it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, so my question is in relation to foreign policy mainly in Georgia's for sure. foreign policy. Um, growing up in Georgia and seeing how popular the issue of European integration was, uh, and now looking at what's happening with the European Union, I was just wondering as a president and um, representative of the government, is the issue still as active as it is integration in NATO or because of Georgia's aim to kind of move ahead and develop into successful economy, joining a union that is crippling with, in regards to economy will be going backwards rather than going ahead? No, I think we have no alternative to Europe. We have no alternative to Europe, that's absolutely sure. And that what we are doing is that, on the contrary, we, we, we've gone a long way. We, done, uh, we had visa facilitation. Next year we'll have DCFTA, which is deep and comprehensive free trade with the European Union. We'll hopefully have visa liberalization by the end of next year, which means visa free travel. Um, uh, and we uh, and we want to integrate, this is out of question that we would ever, uh, you know, we are too small and too much in a risky environment not to want it. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's one thing. And the other thing is culturally, we are Europe. In terms of democratic values, we are Europe. In terms of also closeness and openness to the US, we are Europe because America cannot ex really be successful in a big superpower without Europe. That's uh, I, even some policy makers in Washington might, or some pundits might be skeptical about that, but that's how I see it. And that's how I think most of the American political class still sees it. So from that point of view, if we also want to have this bond with America, we should be in Europe. Uh, and there is no uh, other way for us. Okay, last question. Uh, thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, you are on your way to Chicago, Mr. President, and I'm wondering what your case statement is to NATO and what you're gonna ask them. Well, you know, I think the main thing for Chicago is to it's not an enlargement summit, but it's by already by the fact of you know rapprochement, it's also already a big encouraging and security factor for us. So we want them to say that we are on our way. Uh, we are progressing. I think they will say it. They will say it. You know, we right now we have a, a huge lobbying effort in uh, Washington, in Brussels, in many places. 
fueled with huge amounts of money spent to show the opposite. But I think that's the beauty of democracy, that you, know, you can spend as much money as you want, you will get freedom of speech, but you will, you will not always be listened to. Uh, and I think uh, NATO is going to say what uh, uh, our not so well wishes threat, that Georgia has made significant progress and has become closer to the allies. Now, some people might argue, forget NATO, it's like a horizon, more you approach it, more it goes away. I don't think it's this way. I mean, it looks sometimes like this, but it's still an optical illusion. It's still there, and we are certainly approaching, and we certainly are dealing with societies that are very pragmatic, can be sometimes too pragmatic. Real politics is always there, and especially in fashion and fashionable now. But ultimately, in democracies, they have conscious, and they have uh, consciousness, and they have the thing is that, you know, they, there is no way they can ignore your progress for some time. They might underestimate your progress for some time. They might be delaying for all the procedure reasons, things for some time, but in the end, they, they have sense of fairness. <laughs> and in the end, at a certain moment, somebody will say enough is enough, they've done enough. Mm. And I think, uh, I think that's gonna happen. And certainly, I don't know when, but it's gonna happen for sure in our lifetimes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.